Arthur, you you say Arthur, how you how you got to know her? Because it's a it's a wonderful thing. Well, I never addressed her as Deborah. It was always her Grace on the envelope. But um, poor Deborah had to put up with my childhood scribbling from the age of seven on the subject of chickens, um, because coming from Nottingham, we didn't go to the seaside and some holidays. We went to Derbyshire instead, and we stayed on a an old uh, dairy farm that was becoming a caravan site. And the grand treat of the week would be to go to Chatsworth, which for those of you that haven't been, it's the most beautiful, it's, it is a beautiful house as well as a grand, you know, it's called the Palace of the Peaks, but it's beautiful rather than just grand as Joe Wright, who directed Pride and Prejudice, described it as. So we'd go there and we'd go bullyheading in the River Derwent, catching bullyheads, we'd have a big picnic and we'd either go to the farmyard or the house or the garden, depending what uh, we wanted to do. But in the car park, Debo had over 200 chickens, completely free range. Um, so you'd get out the car and be surrounded by chickens. And as a, a child, that for me was heaven. Um, and my granddad, Ted, once caught me with my head through a pop hole, which is the entrance to a hen house, a little square the size of an A4 piece of paper. And he said, um, you should write to the Duchess who owns all these chickens. And so I did. And you, were, you were seven years old. We might yeah, say. yeah. yeah. Um, and I did, and within a week of sending a scribble, I got a postcard from Lismore Castle. Um, and that began, you know, a pen pal relationship on chickens for years. Um, and so yeah. thanks to Debo, uh, you, are, you actually never met, did you? Well, we met once uh, when I was 12, um, but it was, a, it was a surprise. My mum had arranged it with Helen, Debo's secretary, unbeknown to me. Um, and it was in, I think it was late September and the heavens opened and Debo appeared in a big Land Rover. Me and my mum jumped in the Land Rover as it was pouring down the rain. And I remember she was really interested in what we would bought from the shop, because I think what Debo isn't credited with enough is being the first person to do the gift shop. Um, because Chatsworth Gift Shop was the shop of shops, as was the farm shop. She never claimed to be the first person to do a farm shop, but I think she probably was as well. Um, and so she was really interested in making sure the shops were beautiful and stocked with gorgeous things. So anyway, we went for all the stuff we bought and then we went into a building called the Game Larder, which was Debo's hen house at the time, this hexagonal, beautiful Game Larder, which has since been restored. But back then Debo had it as a, a poultry hen house. Um, and I remember a shuffling, the sawdust and the straw so we could see underneath this gorgeous mosaic that was the floor that was just covered over with wood shavings and um, we collected the eggs now I remember saying to my mum as we were going Where, where's your car and um, my mum went oh we've come on the bus because <laughs> we never my mum never drove and I don't drive so we've always got the 217 from Matlock which <laughs> picks you up outside the m &S. And I always, in normal times, I'd always text you, wouldn't I, when I'm on that bus? Yeah, so you still do. I'm the youngest, yeah. youngest person by about 50 years on this old little stagecoach bus. <laughs> and it's the best way to go to Chatsworth because you can either get off at the edge of the estate and walk through, or you can let it take you to the gates. Yeah. Um, so yeah, 217 from Matlock, Matlock Town Centre, if you want to get to Chatsworth. <laughs> oh, this sort of this wonderful thing, and I, I, I knew, I knew she had this relationship with you, with all these wonderful postcards and you both exchanging little drawings of chickens, mm. but I didn't know you. And then she died and um, you went to the funeral with your mum. And no, my auntie Rose. Actually. With your auntie Rose, sorry, yeah. my auntie yeah. Rose. And I went with, with Charlie and mm. um, we, we met and, yeah. um, over the, over the cucumber sandwiches. Oh. It was completely by chance. Your voice was the yeah. first voice I heard in that marquee above the brass band. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, was I shouting that loud? <laughs> anyway, other other wonderful things happened, and I I think you know Arthur and I both we're both really conscious, aren't we, of the the absolute joy of of cross generational friendship. Mm. It's just an absolutely magical thing and it works I mean I've I'm kind of running out of people <laughs> to be cross-generational upwards now because <laughs> I'm sort of getting up to be one of those at the, at the top 
but Debo was one of them. And, um, and another wonderful friend who lived in, our, in the village in, in Alfriston, Jeremy Hutchinson was, an, was another one. Um, mm. But now I'm go going down ways. <laughs> so Arthur and I are friends. Um, and um, sort of another serendipitous thing that sort of happened to kind of bring us together, which is much more to do with the, the book in the book in question, this wonderful book of Arthur's, his second book, The Flower Yard. And that's to do with the fact that Arthur, um, oh gosh, was that me? Um, I don't think so. It wasn't me either. Oh no, I've lost you. Oh Are no. You... Uh oh. Oh God, come on. Um, <laughs> that Arthur um, fell in love with my sister-in-law, <laughs> as it were. <laughs> <laughs> And um, she is a, or was then, um, a florist who'd written a book or two. Her name is Sarah Raven. Mm -hmm. And some, maybe all of you will know who she is, a genius. I've just been at Perch Hill with Arthur and her actually today. And I must say, it's a staggering thing, the tulip fest that is going on there. Um, so Arthur, what did you do? You were you felt you were at Q. You were you were yeah. you wanted to work in flowers, right? Yeah, I mean um, Sarah's book, The Bold and Brilliant Garden. I used to have in my locker at Q um, because that's what I really felt a garden should be. You know, plants and flowers all day, Alice in Wonderly, Wonderlandy, but productive as well. I love to cut flowers and the picking, the harvest, the abundance, um, and Sarah just ticked all the boxes. And she is very beautiful and, and elegant and, you know, so I fell in love with her, as you said. Um, so while I was living in London, I used to come all the way here on the train um, to the open days. And luckily, Sarah and Adam, I mentioned Adam, they both liked me on the spot, luckily. I got very lucky that day when I met them both. I'm not, not sure they did. They saw that you might be a dog sitter. Well... I think <laughs> dogs, dogs sit at may, maybe, but you know, yeah, very yeah, trusting. They did, of course. They, they, they did. just said, Will you come and house sit for, you know, three, almost three months? And I did, um, you know, um, and I'm not, as you know, I'm not the best person with dogs. I'm better with things that have got two legs. Um, but yeah, I did it, did it. Um, she had a very um, demanding little poodle cross dog at the time called Fri Frizzy. Mm. And I remember having to pretty much sleep with him. It was like sleeping with a gremlin koala bear creature. <laughs> uh, but I did it, got through it. <laughs> and through that, through 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 that, in a way, in a slight, well, not too circuitous route, Sarah introduced you to Emma Bridgewater. Yeah. Matthew Rice, who mm. you, you knew a little bit, but she kind yes. of, who, and they were looking for somebody to make a garden in their Emma Bridgewater in the factory. factory up in Stoke, mm. Stoke on Trent. Yeah. And yeah. you applied, or? Well, I was asked to visit, I'd never been to Stoke before. Um, and it was on the greyest of grey days. Um, Stoke, bizarrely, is, is, is the bit that's often forgotten of the cusp of the Midlands almost. So it's, it's only. 40 minutes from Hucknall where I grew up but I'd never been. Anyway I got off the train and walked to the factory um, on a really grey February day and um, went through the shop and out the back was this square, this concrete square which had been started as a garden, there were a few raised beds um, but I just fell in love with the people in the factory I loved the the warmth of them, I'd got, you know, Pauline was on the till, who you met when we had the Literature Festival, Pauline on the till, you know, you know, little hint of a Scouser accent, and Zoe, who, you know, is more glamorous than Gemma Collins, um, who became a manager. Um, and what I loved about that job was the fact that I was involved in the shop as much as the garden. It wasn't, oh, here's a garden, you're going to be on your own all day long digging because I'm not very good in that kind of environment. I love the fact that it was about flowers in the shop, connecting all the pottery designs with the real concepts. So my job was to bring a bit of farmyard and garden to that factory, that, you know, place very industrial for the visitors, you know, because we have visitors every day. Yeah, but I mean, I think, you know, we should say, it, well, as you did say, it, here was a concrete slab i mean this was mm. not a field that was asking no. to be trans transformed into a beautiful 
Arthur E. Flamboyant garden, you were working with a concrete base. Mm. So what is it that you did in all, what a challenge and how did you mm. make what I can say from first hand was the most breathtaking garden out of a concrete square <laughs> in a factory? What, how did you do it, Arthur? What's the, what was the thing that you did? Tell charm the men who work the mini diggers, I suppose. Because <laughs> we had to we had to literally break up the concrete um, bed by bed. Um, so gradually the garden got bigger and bigger, um, but it took a lot of doing because you could, weren't going down, you were going up. So a lot of, um, I'm not into, I'm not, I don't know building, just the things that break up the concrete, the sledgehammer things automatically. Yeah. So they, they came in in full force. And then days of painting railway sleepers with this horrible tar like paint and then filling them with topsoil and muck and tracking down good soil and, you know, by the ton, the ton bag, lifting them in on mini diggers again. And, and so slowly, slowly, it starts to become a garden. And, um, you know, I knew farmer Julian who lived not far away, all his old cattle troughs would come one by one so they'd become like you know planters and dustbins and dolly tubs and and chickens at one point I, you know i went for a phase i think of thinking i was debo there and that we had about 50 chickens free ranging <laughs> which didn't go down very well with um management but it was quite romantic for a time <laughs> essentially what you were doing was you were you were placing containers on mm. top of that yeah concrete weren't you you were yeah. you, it was container gardening Mm, so it's yeah. not like I grew up with a garden digging. with flower beds digging. There mm. was nothing to dig. No. You, so the whole thing was done in, as you say, what, with railway sleepers. With railway sleepers, yeah. Something that, and something called dolly tubs, which you, yeah. you refer to, which I'd never heard of. Can you just say what a dolly tub is? So a dolly tub is um, basically an old washing machine. All houses would have had one. Um, and they would have all come with what's called a peggy, so a wooden thing that some poor sod would have had to churn the water through to wash on a daily basis. And these things, you know, they used to be ten a penny. They're not anymore, probably partly due to me Instagramming them all the time. But they've they've become like vintage vessels, and they're very elegant, rib sided, like a boiled egg with its top sliced off. And they're a lovely they're size, huge, huge. almost yeah. almost at hip height. The the good ones. Um, and they're very beautiful. Um, so like a long tom only in zinc instead of terracotta, really. And that and that is your those um, are sort of your prime um, plant containers, aren't they? Instead of flower, yeah. conventional flower beds, mm. you 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 garden out of these various different containers, including dolly tubs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know containers are important and as you've seen the, the big copper in Sissinghurst even in the big garden they create a heart don't they you know it's it's the grandeur of having elevation to planting and that's what I love what big containers can do I'm not bothered about little dinky pots everywhere but if you can have a big pot that you can cram loads of beautiful plants into that will then thrive because they've got a big depth of soil to root down into it's fantastic, for, especially for spaces that are hard surfaces. Yes, I mean, I think my um, one of the reasons why this book, this new book of yours, your second book, The Flight, is, su is all, such a bestseller. I mean, it's been in the Sunday Times bestseller list for the do it d practical books. So was um, yours. I know, but we're not talking about me today. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> is that it's so appealing to people like me, who I have to confess, don't, I don't really know where to start. I mean, I grew up, as you know, in the most, in a magical garden, in an absolutely magical mm. garden, but I was never allowed to do any gardening. There were far too many frightening people who were officially there employed to garden at Sissinghurst. Mm. And so I, I didn't even have a, I, didn't, I, mean, I mean, this is not a sob story, but it's, in fact, 
it's the opposite really is that at my sort of great age I'm suddenly becoming inspired to do it because as a child I didn't have any earth I didn't have any earth of my own I wasn't really allowed to garden and I remember I had an English English literature teacher English teacher at school I was about the same age as you were when you when you went first to Chatsworth I was about seven or eight and um this English teacher said that her favorite flower in the world was a would be a blue flower, a, a, a dark, dark blue flower. And um, and I knew there was one at Sissinghurst, one. And <laughs> I think I know where this is going. <laughs> I didn't know that it Oh, was... you didn't pick it. I thought you were gonna say you wouldn't pick it. Oh well, of course I did. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know it was one of the rarest plants, not only at Sittinghurst, but in the entire world and had been nurtured since my grandmother had brought it back from the Himalayas 45 years earlier or whatever. So of course I picked it, the one, and it died on the way to school to give to the teacher. You know, it sort of flopped and uh, there was hell to pay. There was. How did they find out it was you? Head drooping thing. The gardener's work. So my garden, my own gardening kind of green thing, they're not green, you know, my fingers, well, they're sort of, you know, they're, they just never turned green, but they are turning thanks to you and Sarah um, and Charlie, um, <laughs> my husband. Um, and I think that the Uh oh. So, Arthur, um, it's no other, or for people who have um, a small, very limited space, you know, mm. uh, it's amazing for that. And also for anybody who loves color and drama, and and I think that I really love you to explain to anybody, to everybody here about your own growing upness and how you did get that bug when I didn't get it in the smallest the smallest place possible really for a garden such as you've made which is your home garden in Mill Yard so, yeah. could, so say a little bit about that and then perhaps we'll also talk a bit about your grandparents as well mm. uh, well I think I think the reason I started to garden really was prop when I properly started to garden was partly trauma. Uh, my mum and dad separated and we we moved back to Mill Yard, which was the place me and my brother had been way brought up when we were little, little. And then we'd moved to a bigger house and then that all very quickly fell apart. So we found ourselves back at Mill Yard. Um, which, is in, which is which in, in Hucknall, uh, which is ex mining town um, in the middle of a town. I, you know, it's not I'm not pretending, although the photos in the book might portray it as a country cottage. It really is, you know, slap bang in the middle of a town, very close neighbours. Um, and so I started to garden with, with lorries and buses. Yeah, yeah, going the, huge in the relief road constantly. I mean, lockdown in many ways has been a blessing because it's been so quiet, and now it's all come back. So my poor mum is, you know, curtains closed and and uh, upset because it's it, it really does feel like you're within a almost like a traffic roundabout, really. Um, so the plants were a nurturing thing for me mentally, as they still are, and. Um, also something to do for her at a time when she was going through a lot you know I, I couldn't do much as a, as, as a child you have to let your parents get on with it but it was a nice thing to grow a garden by the door and just have colour and abundance there at a time when the house was you know what it's like when you move house and you know depression so you know we didn't unpack our things for months on end um and what is nice about where I live in Hucknall at that time, I had both my grandmas and my granddad Ted alive. So, you know, it was very nice being close to family and both my sets of grandparents' gardens. Um, my mum used to take us up the back streets of allotments to school. So we'd always be, be being shown hedges and birds' nests and, and then we'd be taken to Derbyshire by Ted and Sheila. So me and my brother Lyndon were exposed 
constantly to nature. Um, and I think that has a big impact. And you're constantly sending me photos of your grandchildren and you're taking them to wonderful places, to the zoo um, and things like that. I've got Isabel Dupley on my screen. I don't quite know why. Um, Have you? Yeah, and you've come back now, so that's fine. <laughs> I'm not sure if I've got a setting that's wrong. Can you see? Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> just to just to go to go about about Mill Yard. I mean, there is something um, intensely moving about the way you write about looking after your mother um, and this intensifying of your relationship with, especially with your two grandmothers, Min mm. and Sheila. Um, and somehow the common language between you all was very often plants and growing things and the sort of creativity and life-givingness that that yeah. brought to you as a little boy to comfort and um, get through the sort of pain of, of your parents splitting up. Um, and also, as I know now as a grandmother, this obviously the, the joy that you brought to those, particularly those two wonderful women, mm. your Granny Sheila and your, and your Granny Min. And um, yet this, this, this actual place in which you have made this, I don't know if anybody who's, who's here on, on, on this evening saw Arthur's um, filming of Mill Yard um, on Gardener's World. He, he, he was, it was, what, when was it? Last year, was it? Yeah, this, almost this time last year. Time last it? year. Yeah. But it is, the garden at Mill Yard is 16 foot long by mm. about, what, six foot wide? Perhaps a, bit a, bit wide, a bit wider than six foot wide, probably, probably 10 foot right, wide. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's tiny. It's a front, mm. it's a front garden. It has this road going past it um, with lorries and cars and it's right next door to another house. But when you're in this place, it is as if you've honestly, you're in a little Eden. You, yeah. you're almost oblivious to this mayhem of 21st century traffic and stuff. You are held in this place that Arthur has made, which is, Arthur, say about it, because it's, it's a seasonal garden. Yeah, it's it, seasonal displays. Um, it's like, which, you know, you think yeah. of it like a stage, right? Yeah, like, like a stage, a, a canvas. And it is influenced by, by Sarah, um, largely looking at that book from being little um and just feeling that you know any space i truly believe can be a jungle i think that's what we have to realize you know i think often people are very defeatist when they say you've got a small garden but you know you have to you have to work hard at it but it can be just as gorgeous as a big garden if not easier because you can treat it like you're dressing a room you just need to know that everything you're putting in is alive and it needs a lot of nurturing to to be as gorgeous as a fabric cushion um so that's why i'm very sort of very loyal to plants that i know are going to be good in in that space and i'm very you know i see people going to the garden center like my brother last week he's moved out and now he's doing a garden in a new build house and i let them for about half an hour fill up their basket at the garden center they were putting in things that were going to die as soon as there was a frost and I was like, no, 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 you need to really streamline it. Let's get 12 lavenders, four climbing hydrangeas, um, magnolia in the corner, and then, you know, we'll do bulbs. And it's just having a bit of knowledge. It's like a recipe. It's putting plants together that are going to work together and be successional. And um, one of the greatest beliefs I have is that if all gardens were full of nectar-rich flowers and flowers that were good for pollinators, all these small spaces would add up very quickly because we are on the, the cusp of going into the abyss, I'm afraid to say, if we don't start seriously up our game properly, finally, with what we put in our gardens to, to nurture nature. 
so that's a big part of of the flower yard book you know it it hopefully looks glamorous but at the same time it's it's serving a purpose it's connected to the wildlife that even a tiny garden can support so what so what do you have i mean it is absolutely i know because mm. sometimes when you ring me from there on yeah. on you know our, our video calls mm. um i can hear it is absolutely buzzing it's buzzing yeah. with <laughs> Bee. You know, it's just it's just crammed with mm. what well, I mean there are bees there are butterflies, butterflies hoverflies um and even I don't even mind wasps anymore because I've learned that wasps actually do an important job they eat aphids then you know yes they sting and they, of course you don't want them nesting in your bathroom but um they're they're all welcome I just I get a huge sense of Prozac seeing bees on the flowers I'm growing it kind of makes you feel like you're part of that earth cycle and I think that's why a lot of us are, are struggling because we're totally disconnected from being Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden um yeah I mean I so, yeah. that you you um you write I'm just I've, I've stickered it here about the um I mean you've you've spoken already about the sort of therapy the way that you found the um, experience, even as a very young child, kind of mm. washing through you when you were struggling with your parents' divorce and you, your mother was struggling. And you've, you've spoken of that sort of calming, meditative, balming, um, healing um, power of, grow, of growing things. And you write about it. Um, incredibly, um, incredibly beautifully. Um, you say here, um, uh, the thing about gardening though, is that when you're doing it, it fully consumes the mind and self-awareness disappears. You're mm. part of a wonderland-like dream in that moment. It's totally transporting, a high of earth and colour, and you rediscover a childlike, carefree ignorance. But there is no come down of any sense, only a visual reward and feeling of nurturing. And this book is so packed with that sort of thing. You, the book is fantastically practical. And I've got a few questions because I want to know them myself. All right. I really need to know <laughs> about the sweet pea okay. thing. I really yeah, you and your sweet peas. About... Every year we do sweet peas. I know we do. I Some know. years Every... I've sent Juliet sweet peas no. in those. I mean, sweet peas, and I'm going to ask you all that in a minute. I want to know about las lasagna planting. Bulb lasagna. Bulb, <laughs> bulb lasagna. But I just wanted to just kind of linger for a minute on mm. the beauty of the way you write in this book, because it's very funny. It's packed with stories like you saying about Debo and the chickens and about your dressing your persuading your granny min to go out into the garden and putting on yeah. her balls and turning her <laughs> into sort of helena bonham carter or joanna lumley or any of these other women that you know are sort of heroes to you it wasn't joanna lumley <laughs> no okay no you didn't dress her up as no, no like your there granny no, no i no. often think you're joanna lumley when i see you getting out your beat Oh, do you? <laughs> Actually, that's really a nice. That's such a compliment. I've got a vision of you both turning up together one day. That would be nice. <laughs> we will. Um, we yeah, will one day. Arrive in Mill Yard. Um, mm. But anyway, I, it's just, it is, it is the way that you combine the practical with the, the poetic. You know, you write in, an, in a very... Um, idiosyncratic I mean it's I know exactly what if I see a sentence I know it's by you you have a choice of words that is that picks jewel-like out of a casket of different kind of diamonds and sapphires and emeralds you know which one will I use and you have a very extraordinary gift for describing colour and smell and the whole sort of sensual experience of being around this creative well you're, you're being very flattering i mean well, i don't like know you. 
No, yeah. you do. I'm not normally yeah. quite as nice, maybe. I'm not normally I that mean, nice. I, you, you know I'm... what I like. I don't read many books. I've read your House Full of Daughters book, and I, I admired that because it was so deep, and, and I like books that are deep, that do delve into the beautiful part of life, but also the, the hard bit of life. Um, and I think it's important to tell a story and I think people want stories as well as practical. I, I would find it definitely dull to have to write an ABCD book. Um, and I think that's why, you know, books like by Nigel Slater, by Nigella, books that are both cookbooks, but also personal stories have, are the ones that stay on the shelf because people want to feel that they're with you when they're doing something, I think. They want to know they want to know more about what's the character behind the the thing that they're doing a bit. I think that's what I look for when I'm looking for books, um, whether it's novels or or um, nonfiction. Mm. Well, it definitely it definitely lifts this book up out of a gardening manual into something, you know, extremely different mm. and special. And um, it's completely, it's a lovely book, Arthur. I won't go on. And I actually, actually, I will just one more tiny thing, um, which is the photographs. All the photographs yeah. are taken by you. Even the ones of you are by you. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's where the, the vanity madness comes in. So, yes, um, timer, dustbin lid, wedged up camera lens so it looks at the right level by bits of slate and pound coins and things that have come out of God knows where. <laughs> and then I turn my back after 10 takes and poor cameras on the bricks and I think I've killed the camera, but um, it survives. Yeah. yeah, the photos do take, I, I like doing my own photo photography. Um, maybe one day I'll do a book working with someone maybe like Jonathan Buckley who, who takes all of Sarah's photos. And he, yeah. I've been lucky to know Jonathan because when you're working with somebody and you, you're made to see things through a photographer's point of view, I mean, I'll never forget his, you know, and you should never forget the background and the amount of shots you take where there might be a, a pigeon feather on the brick and you think, oh, you know, you've got to do that, take the feather away and then reshoot it. Um, and chickens are the worst thing because often they look like vultures. So you have to take about 15 photos before a chicken looks like an elegant thing. Yeah, and when you're something. holding the chicken. Yeah, they can often look very flustered and, and you know, so that it all takes time, you know, nothing very few photos are taken one shot then that's done and it also involves getting up early in the morning which I'm not good at <laughs> to get well, the light they are they're, they're really lovely pictures and I know we were going to talk but maybe we Nash maybe we perhaps don't have too much time but we were going to talk a little mm. bit about the power of Instagram and how I mean you have on Instagram you have 50, I think over 55,000 people are tuning in minute by minute to see you put up a picture of a flower, you and a chicken. Well, a bit less of me lately, but yeah, they, they know what they're going to get with me. It's either going to be flowers, me or a chicken, or maybe, you know, a bit of history about something I'm interested in or causes. What I'm loving about Instagram lately is the story. You know, I'm screenshotting news that I feel is important um, and I really love that raise, using Instagram as a tool to raise awareness about the things that I'm yeah. passionate about um, and feel need attention drawing to them so that's that's a lovely thing um, so yeah but it you know I mean my phone's broken actually at the moment so it's quite nice not being able to look at it because <laughs> it does become very addictive um, yeah. yeah, but it has. I mean, it has it. It has it. It's it, been course, amazing for the book. I can't, I can't say it hasn't been. And I'm very grateful for, every, you know, the, the reviews on Amazon are by people that have, have taken proper time to write beautiful things and long paragraphs about, you know, these people, sweet, sweet people. So I'm very grateful. I've also met my lover through Instagram as well. So I wouldn't say that Instagram has been a bad thing. It's been very good. Yeah, that's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Um, very, very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Arthur, um, I don't know if we want to talk about all the other passions. You are doing a podcast at the moment, a absolutely brilliant yeah, with Sarah. With Sarah. Um, every it's every week, isn't it? It's released every week. We do them, we do the recordings back to back. We do about five episodes a time. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've been doing them all through lockdown, so we haven't been together, we've been doing them like this. 
which has been has been quite fun actually um so the next ones we're going to be together so it'll be interesting to see what the dynamics like but you what you do on these on these um podcasts which are on sarah raven's cutting mm. garden website um are um you take a a, f a flower usually one fl one particular flower flower or s seasonal tasks recipes um and, re and which, are, which are lost on me because i don't cook <laughs> no. i'm not a good no. cook um so i kind of turn off for five minutes while sarah talks about a gorgeous recipe that i'm sure many people love to cook um but no it's it's lovely we're going for the seasons talking about plants in depth talking about jobs and we're trying to really make it a chat you know a, a friend's chat about these things that are often made to feel so fussy and and people get so scared I, I it amazes me how scared people are sometimes of gardening of pinching out the tip of a cosmos mm. and um so it's just trying to make people feel confident to get out there and do it i think yeah i mean it's a it's a wonderful series it's new you've only been doing it for kind of what a month or two and it's yeah. I, I've absolutely, I love them. It's eavesdropping on the two of you. And I love it when Sarah <laughs> tries to persuade you to grow and eat tomatoes. And you just... I don't want to see a grow bag. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got a greenhouse, haven't you now? Yeah, we have, we have. Do you know what's in it? Tomatoes, almost nothing but. I thought you were going to get an apricot. Yeah, we, no, well, we haven't. I think we need to it's work peach, on the apricot. But I think it's a dead. peach, yeah. yeah. I don't uh, think it's, it's alive. Oh. <laughs> well it might they do they do lose their leaves it might just have yeah. a little scratch and see if the I think the box. you should come over <laughs> and have a look but look Arthur I just I I am there are like I am going to ask you a couple of practical things because I know that some people have, have have sent in some um questions but look could you just first of all explain about um how to stop sweet peas um turning out to have such tiny little little stalks by by yeah. the end and also the slug problem with the sweet peas because it's sweet pea moment isn't it really for planting out almost well yeah you can either buy them as seedlings now or if you get your skates on sow them um the key thing is giving them a long pot which is why people use toilet rolls because the roots like to have a long root run um i like to use something called a root trainer which is a plastic cell um, that you can reuse year on year and the, you sow one seed into each compartment lovely long roots i mean i sow my sweet peas normally on boxing day but you've still got time to do it the key thing is as soon as they've germinated get them into the cold and full light because otherwise they do go famously leggy and limpy you want them to experience the cold not full frost but cold frame or just have them under a little cloche it can be a even a perspex box upside down um and then you'll be planting them out if they're seedlings plant them out now or if you're starting them plant them out by the end of may and um, feed them seaweed feed comfrey feed tomato feed muck they're the most hungry plants you could grow you know don't starve them and they hate bamboo canes it's too slippy so give them little tricks to grow up or hessian string tied tautly um, and as for slugs use nema slug it's natural biological what's it um, called nema slug any -E um, yeah n-e-m-a um comes in the post you water it around your garden and it will biologically kill all your slugs and it won't kill the songbirds um, which is the most important thing and use grit lots of sharp grit around things like delphiniums that'll keep them off and i like to put grapefruits outside upside down and then that gathers up all the slugs and you chuck the whole thing in the the garden waste bin <laughs> I think that's, that's it okay well that sounds <laughs> Like trying to be quick because I just want to talk to you. Really. <laughs> <laughs> no, also no, one other, one other, which is the lasagna yeah. bulb. Could the lasagna know? bulb. I think yeah. that's amazing. It is or amazing. Am I the only it's, person? No, it, I do like it. it. No, no, it's worth knowing. So, um, in a in a deep pot or a dolly tub or a long tom, you can do layers of compost bulbs, compost bulbs. So that means in the spring you get. Uh, it can start off with hyacinths or muscari. It'll then move on to narcissi and then finally tulips. And you do that by um, compost first, then tulips at eight inches, then just literally an inch of compost above them. Then in go your narcissi at about six inches. 
bit more compost, and then you can do your final layer, which can be hyacinths, muscari, crocus, cover it all over with compost till the compost meets the top of the pot. And that will just mean it starts off like a firework display and just builds and builds and builds until the end of April. Mm -hmm. um, and it just means the whole of the spring is taken care of by one, one pot. Mm. It's a genius thing. Who invented that? I think Sarah, Sarah bought it here from Holland. I don't know who invented it in Holland. She, um, but, she but yeah, it. yeah, but she, she was the first person who, who told me about it. Yeah. It's so effective, isn't it? Because it just yeah, it's it's fabulous. Fabulous. So Higher Simps this year giving. have been incredible. Higher Simps and Narcissus side this year, I think, have been fantastic. Yeah, amazing. And the yeah. last thing on the practical, which I've just learned about today when I was over at Perch Hill, sort mm. of learned, it's called Cut and Come Again. Yeah. Yeah. Only with certain things, so like lettuce, but also flowers like cosmos and dahlias. The more you cut them, the more you will get. So don't think, oh, that flower is looking lovely. I've got to leave it in the garden. If you cut that flower off of the vase, it will mean that that plant gets stronger. It will make it shoot from the base and that makes a bushy plant. So tons more flowers and a healthier plant because you're just making it pump out more and more flowers. So cosmos, as I mentioned, snapdragons, dahlias, all dahlias, and even roses as well. You know, if you cut your roses and then feed and water your roses, it saves you from deadheading. I, you know, I don't like deadheading. I'd rather cut flowers and have them in the garden because the thing about cut flowers is it's bringing the garden in and making the garden connect with the house. And I, I really love doing that, um, you know, dressing the house and connecting the house to the garden. That's a massive part of, of life for me. I hate supermarket flowers. Mm. I sound like a complete snob, but I really do. And it's, it's exactly the same as food from the supermarket. You know, it's limited varieties, largely tasteless. And it's the same with supermarket flowers, no scent. They're full of herbicides, pesticides, Whereas, you know, you grow your own flowers, the scent comes back, you're feeding the bees mm. and it's just pure gorgeousness. So, mm. yeah. So cut and cut and cut, cut and come. Cut and come again. Cut and come again. <laughs> cut and come again. <laughs> it's the way I'm going to be going. I think that's Sounds good. like it. I think Charlie's <laughs> going to have a lot of work on his hands after this talk. No, I'm going to help this time. We're going to help. New, it's a new me. I'm inspired. I am. I really am. You know, it's kind mm. of something has happened something has shifted and and a large part of it is to do with Sarah and a large part of it is to do with you I mean it really is and um I can't recommend this book more <laughs> um Nash did you have some questions that you we have um uh your fans who are uh watching have a, a number of uh questions we've got um Richard McCarthy asks um when do you pinch out your cosmos seedlings Okay, so um, normally when they get about six pairs of leaves, you just take the tip off um, and that makes them, them bush. So as soon as they're starting to, you know, be more than normally eight inches high, start to pinch them out. And if any of them keep growing foliage, pinch them out harder once they're in the garden and that will make them branch. Quite often in July, if any are looking like they're not starting to put up, take the tip off and that will make them start to put up. And... Uh... Uh, chicken questions. A couple of um, uh, Karen and Anna Aladina have asked about keeping bantams. How do you how yes. do you keep them in the garden? How do you keep your plants all right? How do you, how do you protect the plants? And how mm. do you keep your bantams from overwhelming ruining garden? the garden? Um, well, my my girls have their own place in the garden, a large large run which is um, covered with my pecs, and then on top of that, wood chip. Um, so they, they're kept like that for most of the winter time, and that means they're not pecking the plants as they start to emerge in the spring. Um, in the spring, um, upturned hanging baskets and um, roving cloches are very helpful over the crowns of emerging plants, but also planting plants that the hens aren't going to peck. So rosemary is very good. Peonies won't get pecked. Um, all the herbs, uh, all the herbs um, surprisingly, the hens don't tend to like. Um, and the bantams with feathered feet are the best breeds for free ranging in the garden. I, I have to say, our um, our hens tend to like herbs quite a bit. I'm Do a they? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, even there's rosemary. There's nothing like better than thyme. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, my, yours must have better different tastes to mine. There you go. <laughs> They're very special hens, I admit, but I don't know. <laughs> I, I, it's a lot of uh, experimenting, isn't it? Putting plants in and yeah. seeing if there's a. Um, 
if they survive. No, Narcissi actually don't get pecked because Narcissi are famous to taste bitter. Um, so lots of daffodils, if you like daffodils in a hen hen garden. Good. Uh, that's uh, that's helpful, actually. We'll be thinking about that. Um, are there any uh, current gardeners um, besides Sarah whose style you particularly admire? Um, I like Ginny Blom. I think her book's been beautiful. And I like um, Isabella Bannerman. But my favourite gardener is Becky Crowley, who... Um, is was is sort of is she's working for Fleur at Flower at the moment. She set up the cut flower garden at Chatsworth, and I think she's tremendous, um, and is a very special person. Fantastic, thank you. Um, uh, Tanya um, suggests that you come up with a new word for your bulb lasagna because it suggests you build the layers with multiple layers of a single kind of bulb, but you're not. Uh, so instead of multiple layers of one kind of bulb, they're different. I, I don't know what word could possibly be better than bulb, lasagna for it. But... Bulb mosaic, or I don't know. Yeah, that so... would, why not? <laughs> you need the, you need, you need the cheese and, uh, yeah. <laughs> bulb gin and tonic, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, words of appreciation, Donna Wills, uh, your Instagram inspired her uh, tried tulips for the first time with lovely results. So oh, you're God. really affecting people's uh, and inspiring people, which is which is so lovely. And we had a question um, for both of you about your uh, both of you have um, a, a personal and uh, engrossing writing styles, and both of you speak so well. And the question is really: Do you write as you speak? Do you enjoy writing? How do you approach writing? And do you feel that there's a connection with the way you talk? Wow, that's a good nice question. Lovely question. I would say that <laughs> Arthur definitely writes as he talks. He talks with jewels dropping in to his sentences. I often talk, I often write with my head about to slam against the wall. I, I need a deadline. I don't know about you, Julia. I don't write well without a deadline. Oh no, absolutely can't possibly. Sometimes yeah. I have to make a deadline. Sometimes my brother is, I say, Adam, can I? have a deadline and he'll go oh mm. right then monday yeah. and then you know <laughs> then, right, i've got to get it done for adam on monday you know but um uh well do but do i write as i talk no because you know all the arms and all that stuff. yeah taking the arms and the ears out yeah gosh, yeah, yeah all the arms. Yeah. and also um i don't have sort of too many adjectives got to cut them out so you know and sort of just too much I think I have to kind of put the sort of damp down the gush that's what I know I like your gushing. I, I often repeat the same words I have to be careful not to repeat words in the same paragraph that's my biggest issue um, and I have to read everything aloud otherwise it never makes sense actually that is the best tip I mean anyone who ever says you know how should I start so read your own stuff aloud back yeah. to you and, and it, it's amazing what you pick the up. Hiccup, oh. The hiccups that are produced are incredible. You can have read it in your head a dozen times until you read it out loud. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And also for me, not on screen, I have to print it out. I have to see it. I have to hold yeah, it. Yeah, you're very good. I, I need to get into the habit of that more. Um, because that helps. Anything helps, you know. I mean, just anything except for showing it to anyone. Yeah. It's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, sometimes I think, you know, what do I, you know, if I have a book coming out, the kind of, I sometimes I think, I just wish I'd written it and then that's the end. You know, no yeah. publication, no, no horrible reviews, no, no readers really, just, just the money, and then we can go on holiday. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> Buy a few more plants. So, um, question from Lynette. Um, when is it best to use mushroom compost, and when is it best to use manure? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think uh, both are good for mulching. Um, manure needs to be really well rotted to be used in pots. Um, mushroom compost is fine, but they're finding that there's a lot of chemicals in mushroom compost, actually. Um, so it, you have to be careful with, with mushroom compost more than you used to have to be. Um, but generally, yeah, mulching late summer or this time of year is, is fine, if several inches for the border. Um, but for pots, um, yeah, mix, mix mushroom compost and manure together, but make sure the manure is really well watered and ideally from an organic source, because often manure can contain 
um, chemicals which will affect the growth sometimes. So from an organic source, ideally. All right, thank you. And um, Judith McCann asks, uh, do you throw out all the bulbs at the end of a season? Ah. With tulips, yes, um, because what happens to the big beefy bulbs that you're planting in the autumn by the time they're finished flowering, the heat of them being in a pot has made that mother bulb produce tons of babies which aren't going to flower for about three years. Um, so unfortunately, I do treat tulips like an annual flower, jug of flowers. But the good news is almost all the other bulbs are their perennial, provided that you lift them with their foliage still on so that bulb can then absorb all the goodness through the leaves back into the bulb for next year's flower. So hyacinths are especially good for flowering seasons ahead of them, as are narcissi, as are crocus, as are muscari. So apart from tulips, actually, most bulbs are quite perennial if they're treated right. Amazing. Thank you. Um, I think that um, brings, brings us to the end of this evening's session. I'd like to thank um, all of our guests, everybody who joined us uh, from all over the place. I, I hope you've enjoyed it. We will be... Uh, we will be putting this, I hope, on YouTube after a little mild editing of the beginning and perhaps the ending. I'd like to remind you all that um, we offer signed copies of Frostquake and we even have some signed copies of The Flower Yard available online through our website um, or stop in for a browse, which you are now allowed to do. Hooray! Yay! How good hooray, is that? Hooray, Yay. hooray, hooray. And uh, Juliet, Arthur, thank you both so much for uh, at the end of, I know, a really busy day for both of you, <laughs> taking the time out um, to talk together. I've, uh, I've really enjoyed it. I'm sure everybody else has really enjoyed it. It's been a, a really special time for us. And um, I want to say uh, it will make me appreciate the garden. It may even make me work in the garden a little bit. I'm sure my wife would appreciate that no end. <laughs> Juliet, I look forward to hearing about your tomatoes, especially. Um, everybody, yes. if you'd like to, uh, just for a moment, unmute yourselves, unmute yourselves, yourselves, say hello, say thank you, wish them well with their books, Arthur's bestseller, Juliet, continue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Good you evening. And, uh, wonderful <laughs> notes through the chat. That was delightful. Thank you. Loved it. Thank you. Thank you Thank both you. so much. That Thank was you, Juliet. Thank you, Arthur. Lots of love. See you soon. Bye. 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 Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye